Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the privilege of being here to study the marvelous things from your word and specifically from the book of Genesis. We ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we study about the origin of evil and how you will dispose of it eventually very, very soon. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to begin our study in uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 31. Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 31. This is a very well-known verse. It's speaking about the conclusion of creation. And it makes a very important statement. Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 31. This is at the end of the sixth day. It says there, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Notice every day God says, sees that it's good. But on the sixth day we're told that God saw that everything that he had made was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the Bible begins by telling us that God made everything good in this world. But then we go to Genesis chapter 3 and we discover that in the Garden of Eden a mysterious serpent shows up. And this mysterious serpent is actually slandering God which seems to be a discordant note in the context of everything being created good and created perfect. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. See, God had said you're going to die if you eat from the tree. The serpent says, You will not surely die. In other words, God is a liar. Verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now in Genesis, the serpent appears suddenly, speaking, talking. And it makes you wonder where this serpent came from. Because God made Adam and Eve in his image. He gave them the capacity to speak. He gave them the capacity to communicate, to make moral decisions, to hold on rational discussions. Here we have a serpent holding a rational discussion with the woman. The question is, where did this serpent come from? Obviously, the serpent as he's spoken of here in Genesis chapter 3 was not part of the creation of God. I know that the snake itself was. But the serpent who is using this animal obviously was not created during creation week because God made everything good. Now where did he come from? Go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 12. <coughs> Revelation chapter 12 speaks about the origin of this slanderous serpent. We're told there in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7 the following, And war broke out in heaven. Where did war break out? It broke out in heaven. This is important. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail. That is, the devil and his angels did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old, now notice the reference back to Genesis. The old King James Version says, the ancient serpent. So this is referring to the story in Genesis 3. That ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now we know how the devil got to planet earth. Scripture tells us that he was cast out of heaven and he ended up here on planet earth. Now I'm so thankful that God in his holy word has given us some details about the origin of this being in heaven. 
We know about his origin. We know about his sin in heaven. And we also know what his final end will be. Let's study a few things about this being as he originally existed in heaven. Go with me to the book of Ezekiel chapter 28 and I would like to read verses 13 and 15. Ezekiel 28 and verses 13 and 15. Speaking about this being it says this, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. Notice what we find in verse 15. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. How was this being created according to Ezekiel chapter 28? He was created perfect in his ways until iniquity was found in him. God did not create the devil. God created a glorious perfect being who chose to become the devil. Because if God created the devil, God is a greater devil than the devil. But scripture tells us that God created him perfect in all of his ways. He was beautiful. Now the question is, who created this glorious being, which according to Isaiah his name was Lucifer, the star of the morning. Who created him? Well go with me to Colossians chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17. Colossians chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17, we read this in our last lecture but we want to read it again because it's very important to understand who created this glorious being. It says there in verse 16, speaking about Jesus, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. Clearly these verses teach that Jesus was the creator of everything in the universe. Not only things in heaven but also things on earth. Which must mean that Jesus was the creator of Lucifer. Now let's go back once again to Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 12. Here we find another interesting detail about this glorious being. It says there, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. And of course the king of Tyre is an earthly being, but behind the earthly being is this Lucifer. And so it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Is it clear to you that this being was originally perfect? He was full of wisdom, he was full of beauty, and that there was no sin in him when he was created by God? This is very very clear in Ezekiel chapter 28. Now what position did this majestic individual occupy? Well go with me to Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 14. Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 14. We find a very important detail here that I want to underline. Very very important. It says here, speaking about this uh, being, you were the anointed cherub who covers 
Wow, now we understand that this being was an angel. And he wasn't any old type of angel. He was a covering cherub, according to this verse. Now let's continue reading verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. By the way, that's Mount Zion. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. The fiery stones are stars. They represent angels. He walked up and down in the midst of the angels according to this. Now you'll notice here that he's called the covering cherub. Now what is that, a covering cherub? Well, we have to go back to the book of Exodus to discover what a covering cherub is. Let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 25 and verses 19 and 20. Exodus chapter 25 and verses 19 and 20. Here we find a description of the sanctuary that Moses was commanded to build by God. And I want you to notice uh, when the Ark of the Covenant was built how it was supposed to be built. It says there in verse 19 make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end that is of the Ark of the Covenant. You shall make the cherubim, that's the plural, you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat and the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, and now notice the next word, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another, the faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. So you'll notice that the cherub, cherubim, or the cherubs, were on either side of the Ark of the Covenant. The top of the Ark of the Covenant was known as the mercy seat and that's where the glory of God was manifested which is known as the Shekinah. In other words the Ark of the Covenant, the cover, the mercy seat represents the throne of God. Which means that Lucifer was one of the individuals who were closest to God who was sitting on the throne because he was one of the covering cherubs on one of the sides of the Ark of the Covenant. Now somebody might be thinking, well Pastor Bohr, are you saying that in heaven there was an Ark of the Covenant originally? Wasn't that just an earthly uh, piece of furniture that God told Moses to build? The fact is folks that the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5 that the earthly sanctuary was a copy of the heavenly sanctuary. In other words, what God did was show Moses on the mountain a scale model of the heavenly sanctuary and he told Moses to build the earthly sanctuary in harmony with the scale model of the heavenly one which God showed him. So this must mean that if there was an Ark of the Covenant in the earthly sanctuary and the earthly sanctuary is built according to the scale model which is a model of the heavenly sanctuary that must mean that the heavenly sanctuary must also contain what? it must contain the Ark of the Covenant now let's prove that from scripture go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19 chapter 11 and verse 19 of the book of Revelation here we are told uh, of a moment when the heavenly temple is opened and I want you to notice what John sees inside the heavenly temple of which the earthly temple is a shadow or a copy it says there then the temple of God was opened in heavens and the ark of his what? the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Question, is there an Ark of the Covenant in the heavenly sanctuary? According to this verse. Absolutely. Because John saw the heavenly sanctuary opened and he saw in, he saw in the temple the Ark of the Covenant. So when you have these two cherubim in the earthly sanctuary on either side of the Ark of the Covenant is that a reflection of two 
covering cherubs that are originally and also now even, even though Lucifer isn't one of them, does the heavenly sanctuary have an Ark of the Covenant and are there cherubim on either side? Obviously yes. Now there's something else that we need to take a look at when we talk about the Ark of the Covenant. Go with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 2. Here we find a description of the Ark of the Covenant. And we're going to find that inside the Ark of the Covenant was something very, very important, which all of us have heard of. Actually, let's begin by reading verse 1. It says, At that time the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tables of stone, like the first, because Moses had broken the first, and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke and now notice this and you shall put them in the ark what was Moses supposed to put in the ark? he was supposed to put the tables of stone with the ten commandments inside the ark of the covenant now here's my question if the earthly sanctuary is a reflection of the heavenly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary has an ark of the covenant and the earthly sanctuary has an ark of the covenant and the earthly sanctuary has the ten commandments within it what must be within the ark of the covenant in the heavenly sanctuary? you must also have the ten commandments because if the earthly sanctuary is a reflection of the heavenly and the earthly sanctuary had the Ten Commandments inside it must mean that in heaven the Ark of the Covenant must also contain what? it also must contain the Ten Commandments and by the way the reason why the Ten Commandments are inside the Ark the mercy seat is above is because God is trying to teach that the Ten Commandments are the foundation of God's government they are the foundation of God's throne just like the laws of the United States are the foundation of our government in other words the mercy seat is the throne of God the Ten Commandments underneath inside the Ark of the Covenant represent the fact that the Ten Commandments are the foundation of God's throne the foundation of his government now we need to take a look at something that happened with this being Lucifer go with me to Ezekiel chapter 28 and let's read verse 16 Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 16 something happened with this being it says there by the abundance of your trading we'll come back to what that means later you became filled with violence within and you sinned you what? sinned therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you O covering cherub from the midst of the fiery stones why did God cast this being out of heaven? because he what? because he sinned the question is what is sin? go with me to 1 John chapter 3 the Bible has a very clear definition 1 John chapter 3 and we will read first of all verse 8 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 here we are told and the reason why we connect, connect this verse with Ezekiel 28 is because uh, it's speaking about the same being now notice verse 8 it says he who sins is of the devil for the devil has sinned from Mount Sinai on what does the text say? it says for the devil has sinned from the beginning for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil so Jesus came to destroy sin, right? correct? when did Satan sin? he sinned from the beginning, where? in heaven, now what is sin? go with me to verse 4 whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness I like the way the King James Version translates it 
it says sin is the transgression of the law in other words sin is breaking God's holy law according to 1 John chapter 3 and the devil sinned from the beginning so let me ask you did Satan did Lucifer break God's holy law he must have and where was that law that law was in the Ark of the Covenant in fact we just noticed that the angels you know they were on either side of the ark and they were looking down in reverence towards the place where the glory of God was manifested towards God's holy law in other words this being came up with the preposterous idea of breaking the very law of God which was found in the ark of the covenant and thus he sinned and for this reason the Bible says that God cast him out of heaven and he came to this earth now we need to look at something that happened on this earth now that we know where this being originated where he was he was created perfect by the way he was created he's not eternal he's gonna have an end according to scripture because he was created by God everything that God creates he can destroy if he wishes now let's notice what happened when this being came to this earth go with me to Genesis chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17 Genesis chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17 here we find a commandment given by God to Adam and Eve and it says there and the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may freely eat I like the fact that God gives a positive command first he says you can eat of every tree of the garden verse 17 but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die one command that God gave Adam and Eve now listen to what I'm going to say in this one command were actually contained all of the Ten Commandments you say now how is that? well let me take a look at some of them you know I've gone through all of them but I'm going to go just through some of them and I'm going to ask you if when Adam and Eve ate from the tree they actually broke that commandment the first commandment says thou shalt have no other gods before me did Adam and Eve break that commandment? what did, the, what did this serpent say to Eve? you shall be like God so did she break that commandment? did Adam? absolutely let's take the third, uh, the, the third commandment what does the third commandment say? you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain you say well Eve didn't break that one she certainly did do you know in fact that she attributed to God words that God had not spoken bringing dishonor upon the name of God because she told the serpent God had tol has told us that we should not eat of the tree or even touch it the fact is God didn't tell them that they couldn't touch it God told them that they couldn't eat so she's bringing dishonor to the name of God what about the commandment that says honor your father and your mother does that include honoring our heavenly father? yes did they break that one? yes how about the commandment thou shalt not kill did they break that one? what came into the world as a result of what they did? death came into the world what about the commandment that says thou shalt not commit adultery spiritually did they break that commandment? they most certainly did because their only love relationship was to be between them and God marriage is used as a symbol of the relationship between God and his people but when Eve listened to the serpent she so to speak spiritually adopted a different lover than God there's a commandment that says thou shalt not steal did Eve steal? yes she took the fruit that did not belong to her there's a, covenant that, a, a commandment that says thou shalt not covet did Eve covet? it says so in Genesis chapter 3 and so contained in this one command in principle were all of the ten commandments now the question is what was the serpent trying to get Adam and Eve to do? let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5 Genesis chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5 then the serpent said to the woman you will not surely die 
In other words, God is lying. You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. We'll study this a little bit later on. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you know what the serpent is really telling the woman? He's saying, listen, you think that God has to define what is good and what's evil? You think that you just have to listen to God, that it's okay to eat from all of the trees, but you can't eat from this one because you're going to die? He says, listen, you don't have to have God define what is good and what is evil. You can be God, and you can define that yourself. You can know what is good and evil without God telling you what is good and evil. Are you understanding what I'm saying? What is the serpent trying to get Eve to do? He is trying to get her to disobey God's commandment. He is trying to get Eve to disobey God's law. Is that exactly what happened to him in heaven? Did he sin? Did he transgress God's law? He most certainly did. So now he comes to earth and he says, I'm going to do the same thing with the human race. I'm going to get them to break God's commandment, God's law. I'm going to get them to depend upon themselves and in that way they will have the same experience that I have. They will be mine. They will be my slaves. So what happened to him in heaven is now happening on earth as well. By the way, the law is much deeper than what most people realize. Let's go to the other passage that speaks about the rebellion of this being, Lucifer, and look at a deeper dimension of sin. You see, sin isn't only breaking a code. You know, some people look at the Ten Commandments just as a bunch of rules written on tables of stone. They say, okay, I'm not supposed to steal, I'm not supposed to commit adultery, I'm not supposed to kill, I'm not supposed to bear false witness, I'm not supposed to covet. Okay, I'm going to try my best to obey the Ten Commandments. And they can't. Because in ourselves we can't. Because we have a sinful nature. We'll be talking about that, by the way, in our next lecture. What on earth is happening is our next lecture. We're going to be dealing with this issue of the observance of God's holy law. Sin is deeper than breaking a code. Sin is deeper than breaking a list of rules. Now let's notice what the essence of sin is. It is breaking the law, but there's something deeper than just breaking the law. Notice Isaiah chapter 14 and verses 12 to 14. Here it speaks about Lucifer and what happened to him. It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, now it's going to explain the reason why he was cast down. For you have said in your heart, and I'm going to underline one little word here, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I would say that Lucifer had an eye problem. And the eye problem is called myopia. He was nearsighted. He could only see himself. In fact, do you know that we're told, and we're not going to read this now, but I'll just mention it. We're told that Lucifer was created with four assets. First of all, he was created beautiful, with beauty. Secondly, he was created full of wisdom, wise. In the third place, he was created very rich. You can find that in Ezekiel 28. And in the fourth place, he was created to occupy a very powerful position next to the throne of God. And so Lucifer had beauty, wisdom, riches, 
and power. But if you read Ezekiel 28, you will discover that it says that he was lifted up because of his beauty. We're told that he corrupted his wisdom. We are told that his heart was lifted up because of his riches. And we are told in the passage that we just read that he said, I will be like the Most High. I'm not satisfied with being second fiddle. I want to be first fiddle. I want to be the main thing. So really at the, at the heart of breaking God's law is what? Self. That is the, the root of breaking God's holy law. Now I'm going to uh, mention some words and I want you to give me the antonym of these words. Right? Wrong. Good. Good? Evil. Come on. You just had supper. You can do better than that. White? Light? Love? I knew you were going to say that. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is self. Let's take a look at the Ten Commandments. Go with me to Romans chapter 13 and verses 8 through 10. I always trick people with that one. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Romans chapter 13 and verses 8 through 10. I'll bet you this is the second time I've tricked some of you too. Uh, Romans chapter 13 and verses 8 through 10. It says here, the Apostle Paul speaking, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Did you catch that? Loving others is to what? To fulfill the law. Somebody says, well which law? Verse 9, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So Lucifer's attack was against God's love. In attacking the law, he was attacking God's love. Now what do I mean? Can you really understand the Ten Commandments unless you understand that the purpose of the Ten Commandments is to protect relationships? For example, honor your father and your mother. Could you really keep that commandment unless you had a father and a mother? <laughs> Obviously not. You shall not kill. Could you keep that commandment if there wasn't someone to kill? You shall not commit adultery. Could you break that commandment if there wasn't someone else's wife that you commit, could commit adultery with? You shall not steal. Could you break that commandment if there wasn't someone you could steal from? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Could you break that commandment unless you had a neighbor to bear false witness against? You shall not covet. Could you covet if there wasn't something that belonged to someone else that you could covet? Obviously not. The purpose of the commandments is to protect relationships. Let me ask you the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, does that protect human relationships? Is it a good commandment? How many of you believe that the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, is a good commandment? Think that's a good commandment? Don't think it was nailed to the cross, huh? It's a good commandment. How would you like to live in a world where everybody keeps the Ten Commandments? What kind of world would it be? Oh my lands, it'd be wonderful. You would have no death, no killing, Everybody would respect each other's wife. You could leave your doors open day and night. No theft. And by the way, the first four commandments protect our relationship with God, our loving relationship with God. You see, if I love God, I'm not going to have other gods. If I love God, I'm not going to worship a representation of God which lowers my image and view of Him. 
If I love God, I'm going to respect His name. If I love God, I'm going to spend the time that He has set aside for me to spend with Him. To enhance my relationship with Him. In other words, the purpose of the Ten Commandments is to protect human relationships. They define what love is. So an attack on the Ten Commandments is an attack on love. Raise your hand if you're understanding what I'm saying. To attack the commandments is to attack love. And by the way, when we break the Ten Commandments, you break relationships. When Adam and Eve sinned, they're hiding from God. They've broken a relationship. In fact, Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, Your iniquities have made separation between me and you. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they broke their relationship. Adam, who by the way knew what he was doing when he sinned, but he couldn't stand the idea of living without Eve. His real sin was that, was that he loved Eve more than he loved God. He says to God, huh, this woman that you gave to be with me. A little while before, he's saying, oh I can't stand the idea of, of, of living without Eve, so I'm going to sin too. So now, he's bickering with Eve. Because when they broke God's law, they broke their relationship. Their loving relationship, one with another. Are you understanding the depths of sin? And by the way, sin basically is selfishness. Because selfishness is the opposite of love. Do you believe that? You know what, I have to do a lot of marriage counseling. Do you know what the biggest problem is among couples? Selfishness. He doesn't do what I want. He doesn't go where I want to go. He doesn't pay any attention to me. He forgets my anniversary. And the same the other way around. It's self. That's why we find in Isaiah chapter 14 the word I used six times by Lucifer saying I will be like the Most High. His attack was an attack on the love of God which was attacking the law of God. But the law cannot be isolated from human relationships. So whoever today tells you that the law was nailed to the cross, that Christians don't have to keep the law, what they're doing is they're attacking love. Because love is fulfilling the law. Somebody says, well I only live by two now. Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor. What does it mean to love God? It means you keep the first four. What's the definition of loving your neighbor? It's the last six. The Ten Commandments simply amplify the two. But they do not get rid of the two commandments. Now the question is, how many in heaven followed Lucifer in his rebellion? Go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. Do you know that we live in a world filled with demons? But do you know that for every demon there's two of God's angels. Praise the Lord! It's two against one! <laughs> and, all, and we have God on our side besides. So don't worry about it. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. Revelation 12 and verse 4. Speaking about this dragon, the ancient serpent, it says his tail, we'll talk about the tail in a moment, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So you find how many of the stars of heaven did he take with him? A third of the stars. What were those stars? Go with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. And they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The stars represent what? Angels. 
So a third of the angels were cast out with him. And by the way, when you realize that according to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 11, if you go with me there for a moment, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 11, the number of angels is practically incalculable. <laughs> you know that this world has lots of angels involved in the battle between righteousness and unrighteousness. It says there in Revelation 5 verse 11, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels round the throne, the living creatures, and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. By the way, in the Greek there's no word for million. And so the, the, it's calculated by multiplying thousands. Ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. How could the devil get one-third of the angels to follow him in his rebellion? Well, we need to take a look at this because this is very important because the devil is doing the same thing on earth right now. If we know what he did in heaven, we're going to know what he does on earth, and we're going to be able to protect ourselves from his power. Let's go back to Ezekiel 28 and verse 16. And notice a very important word here. We're going to see the strategy that the devil used to deceive a third of the angelic host to follow him in his rebellion. It says there in Ezekiel 28 and verse 16, By the abundance of your trading, that's the word I want to underline, by the abundance of your trading, you, you became filled with violence and you sinned. What did he do? The abundance of his what? Trading. So the devil trades. The devil is a wheeler dealer. The devil is a businessman. The question is, what does he trade? What does he try to sell? Well, we need to look for this word other places in Scripture. It's the same root word, but, with, but it's translated differently. It helps us understand what he did. Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 9. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 9. The very same root word. You would never know it by the translation, but if you go to Strong's Concordance, you'll find that it's the same root word in Hebrew. It says in verse 9, In you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. In you are those who eat of the mountains. In your midst they commit lewdness. That word slander is the same root word trading. Isn't that interesting? You can check me out in, in Strong's Concordance if you wish. And notice that it says in you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. Do you remember that we read in Ezekiel chapter 28 that because of his trading he became filled with violence within? So what was he trading? He was actually trying to sell what? He was trying to sell lies. What do you say sometimes when somebody says something that sounds pretty preposterous? You say, I don't buy that. We even use the expression today. Oh, you can't sell me that one. You see, what he was trying to do was to sell his slanderous accusations against God. Notice also Leviticus chapter 19, where the same root word is used. Leviticus chapter 19 and verses, actually verse 16. We'll just read one verse. Ezek, um, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 16. God is saying to Israel, you shall not, not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor, I am the Lord. The word talebearer there is the same root word that is used for trading in Ezekiel 28. So what did the devil do? What did Lucifer do in heaven? He started telling tales about whom? About God. Do you know what he said? He said, listen, we don't need God to be telling us what's right and what's wrong, what we can do and what we can't do. We're smart enough. We can decide that on our own. You know, God is a slave master. 
he wants us to render him blind service you can see this by the way in which the devil spoke to Eve in the garden he says you know you don't have to accept what God says as the definition for good and evil he says you can be God knowing good and evil by the way he was telling Adam and Eve that God wanted them to be blind because he says if you eat from the tree your eyes are going to be open God wants blind service he wants you just to obey without questions well you don't have to have God tell you what to do you're smart enough and you're wise enough to decide that on your own so he's saying God is a dictator and a third of the angels bought his lies now do you remember the tale? It says a, a, a t the tail of the dragon drew a third of the stars now what does the tail represent? go with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 15 Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 15 very clearly we're told what the tail is there it says here in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 15 the elder and honorable he is the head the prophet who teaches lies he is the tail what is the tail? the prophet who teaches what? lies how did the devil get a third of the stars of heaven to follow him? by telling lies the tail is a prophet who tells lies and by the way there's an interesting phonetic relationship between tail and to tell a tale in other words the tail draws a third, a third of the angels by telling tales about God and we know that because he came to the earth and he did the same thing didn't he? if you know what he did on earth you will know what he did in heaven we have biblical examples of this as well it's very very interesting you take for example the story of Absalom the son of David David was the king Absalom was his son and Absalom gets the preposterous idea that that he needs to be sitting on the throne instead of his father and so he sits at the gate of Jerusalem and anybody who comes to the king for judgment to set things right Absalom says don't even bother to go to the king he doesn't care about you but if you put me on the throne I would look out for you same spirit of Lucifer in heaven he said to the angels listen if you put me on the throne things will improve no laws everybody can live according to the law that comes from within I guess he was the first new ager <laughs> no dictators everybody will live to himself same thing that the devil has done with human beings on this earth ever since John chapter 8 and verse 44 we're told that Satan is a liar and the father of it in other words Satan is the father of lies according to scripture from the very beginning he lied about God and by the way it's no coincidence that Jesus came to this earth to reveal the truth do you know that Jesus came to this world to counteract the lies of Satan? Satan said oh God only sits on the throne and he has everybody serve him and do what he says and when somebody doesn't do what he says he makes them sick and he casts them out of heaven and he mistreats them and he beats them up Jesus comes down to the earth and he, he, he leaves his throne in heaven he who had the power of God now becomes a servant the Jews believe that God made people sick why is that man blind? who sinned? his parents or did he? why does that man have leprosy? oh because it's the finger of God they believe that God made people sick Jesus came to the earth and now he heals people he casts out demons he restores people and the devil hated him because Jesus was showing what God is really like that God loves human beings that tsunami 
That wasn't any more an act of God than the man in the moon <coughs> exists. I mean, how can you conceive that God caused that tsunami to kill over a quarter of a million people? The book of Job tells us that this is the work of Satan. It is not the work of God. Yes, God withdraws His hand and allows it, but God does not cause these things. Now the question is, is the devil ever going to have an end? Do you know where he got his death blow? He got his death blow on the head. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. But you know when his head was whacked by Christ the devil still exists. In one of our future lectures we're going to study about the conflict between David and Goliath. That story has to be seen in the light of Genesis 3.15. You know David he swung his sling through the stone the stone encrusted itself in his forehead and he fell to the ground but he wasn't dead. He was almost dead. He had received the death blow on his head. But the Bible says that David went and with his own sword he took out the sword and he cut off his head. The devil has been wounded with the stone. What only remains is for his head to be chopped off. And that will, be, that will happen after the millennium which we will study in this seminar. Revelation chapter 20 refers to that. Notice Ezekiel chapter 28 and verses 18 and 19 speaking about the end of this being. Praise the Lord that he's going to come to an end. Meanwhile we have to battle with him. We have to put up with his lies. But we don't have to give in to his lies. When the devil tells us to break God's law we don't have to break God's law. Because we know what he's up to. Now notice Ezekiel 28 and verses 18 and 19. It says you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities by the iniquity of your trading, there's the word again therefore I brought fire from your midst it devoured you and I turned you to ashes upon the earth notice it's going to be reduced to ashes all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you you have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Is that good news? That's great news. It's coming soon. Now allow me to conclude by saying this. In this world there are only two groups. Not three. There's not the good, the bad, and the half bad. Those are going, that are going to heaven, to hell, and to purgatory. In the world there are two groups. The seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman's seed. The seed is Christ. But Christ has seed. If you are Christ, you are his seed. So there's only two groups in the world. Now let me ask you, what is it that characterizes both groups? Go with me to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10 and actually we'll read uh, several verses from 1st John as we bring this to a close. 1st John chapter 3 and verse 10 we find the two groups mentioned and what characterizes the two groups. It says there, in this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. In this way you can know who a child of God is and who the, a child of the devil is. Notice what the characteristics are. Whoever does not practice righteousness what is righteousness? If sin is transgression of the law, what is righteousness? It is obeying God's law, not because we can do it, but because we love God and He empowers us. You need to come to the next lecture. We're going to talk about the law of God and how it is possible to overcome, not in ourselves, but in His power, because we love Him. And so it continues saying there, 
in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10 in this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is he who does not love his neighbor and what is keeping the commandment? it is what? love now go with me to two passages in closing 1 John chapter 2 1 John chapter 2 and let's read verses 3 and 4 now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments he who says I know him and does not keep his commandment is a liar and the truth is not in him hello who was the first liar and the truth was not in him? John 8 44 who was it? Satan so whoever says I know him and does not keep his commandments whose seed is he? Satan's seed, it says here, it says so here now let's notice one more text 1 John chapter 5 very quickly and verse 3 for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome because some people say oh that old law that's such a hard thing to keep it's such a burden don't believe it <laughs>